you want me. I am saying, I want you. I am the Lord your God. I'm saying that I want you. I want you to enforce the power of my kingdom here on earth. I want you to show the world that I'm the light. And I put my light in you that you will shine. I want you to be the giant killers. I want you to be the lion killers. Yes, you want me. But I want you more than you want me. I cannot fulfill the promise that my father made to change the whole world except with you. You are the ones that I want. You are the ones to rise to the occasion. Do not be caught up with the world and the things that are happening around you and realize that I, the Lord your God, I am with you. It's what I said. Why live like, like you are an orphan that nobody, your God is not with you. Why? I poured my love to you. I told you I love you every time I remind you of my love and yet you only want me. You just want me for what you can get from me. What I can give you. I want you so that everything that I have to the world through you. I hear the voice saying who will go and who will I send? Will you lift your voice and say, Lord, here am I, send me? Or are you still asking, I want you, I want you. But do you really want me? Or are you singing from your lips and your heart is far away from me? Oh, come on. Hear me this morning, says the Lord. When you reach out, with your spirit and your mind to me and allow me to work a work in your heart your neighborhood will be changed and the new things will be happening not only in your life but in the life of your friends and your family trust me says the Lord trust me trust me don't worry about your weakness or your failure. When you come close to me, all of that will disappear because my glory will melt them out of you. Will you stretch your hands right now this way? Holy Spirit, as we stretch our hands, we're like a little kid that's stretching our hand to daddy to pick him up. We stretch our hands right now. Father, pick us up now. From every disappointment, despondence, and fear, and doubt, and unbelief, pick us up. And fill us. Fill us with yourself. That as we hear your word this morning, the fire that you have already started will keep burning until every dross in our body, our mind, and spirit is burned out for your glory. In Jesus' name. Everybody, amen. You may be seated.
presence of the Lord is in this place. And you want change? It's up to you to receive it. Because it has released it this morning as we worship. Hallelujah. Well, just as the scripture says, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. I'll just calm down a little bit. Today, I know it's <laughs> oh, hallelujah. I'm not going to be preaching. Don't worry. <laughs> July 6th through July the 14th. This church is sending a team of missionaries to Grenada. Somebody just give Jesus a clap of free. Yeah. I didn't say give me. I said give Jesus a clap of free. Can you just give Jesus a clap of free? Yeah. We're a brand new church. And but we are mission minded. Amen. We want to reach the world as he called us to do. So today, even though it wasn't announced years or months ago, today I want to appeal to you. We are going to Grenada. The team that's going to Grenada, we're going to pray for them, but not today before we leave, right? We're going on the Saturday, the 6th of June, July. And we're coming back on the 14th. So I want to appeal to you to sow into this ministry. As we go, you go. Amen. Whatever God did there, he did it because of you. Yes. So reach deep in, that, in your inner being, not your pocket. Because you look at your pocket, you won't give. But look down inside you and see. We have the box there. Write your check, Fusion Madison. And then at the bottom there, I say Grenada Trip. You just put it there. And if you have the cash, put it in the envelope, write Grenada Trip. So that would be obvious. We are going, and we are going to make a difference. And you are going, and you are going to make a difference. Amen. So bless those who are going, and God will bless you back. All right? Amen. So I think that's pretty simple. Give, and it shall be given to you. Press down, shaking together, and if you don't give, you don't get a run over. I mean, not run over by card, but run her over by, you know what I mean? <laughs> All right, I'm going to invite my brother to come on down and uh, break the bread with us. We didn't give Jesus a clap offering this morning. Yeah. I know, it's, it's something. <laughs> Folks, don't we look like twin? <laughs> <laughs> We got the same dad, just different moms. Yeah. <laughs> How's everybody doing? If you don't get, say yeah. yeah. Hey, I know that we've given you a lot of opportunities to give to different things over the last several months, and you guys have sown faithfully. And uh, man, I, I want to be a church that's known for its generosity and its 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 commitment to the Great Commission. And there are just times where if the Lord doesn't allow you to go, he allows you to sow. 
And, and so think of it that way. If I can't go, I'm at least going to sew because somebody's going to go. And, and, and listen, I, the statistic I heard a while back was for every dollar sewn into overseas missions, one soul comes to Christ for every dollar. Yeah. You, you understand how much more fertile those dollars are when they, when they, when they go around the world. So uh, just continue to do that. And uh, thank you for all that you're doing. And just like Reverend L said, if you want to make sure it goes to Grenada, just put Grenada in the memo line or Grenada on the envelope. That's where it'll go. Um, and uh, so I'm going to open with a word of prayer and we're going to get right into this today. Father, just thank you for the opportunity to be here in your house today on this beautiful Memorial Day weekend. And Lord, thank you for the sacrifice that so many people made that uh, did not come home so that we could have a place to worship and have a home that's safe. And Lord, today is, is not the day we just celebrate veterans. We celebrate the men and women who went and did not get to come back to their families. And Lord, we just know that there's a special place for them in our hearts and in our nation. And, and uh, Lord, we're here because they, they sacrificed. So today, Lord, thank you for those families that gave that sacrifice as well. Just pray, Lord, that you would help me as I get into the word. Help me to decrease so that you might increase in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you for being here with us today on this Memorial Day weekend. You could have been on a, on a pontoon. You could have been in, a, in, a, in an RV, but you chose to be in the house of God, and there's just no better place to be. And uh, those of you that are watching us online, we're better in person, believe me. And, uh, and so I'm excited to be here. If you didn't get a chance, you're, 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 you're sewing into the downstairs. I, I just want to tell you, our kids' church room is on point, man. If you didn't get a chance to peek your head in there, uh, we gave them a, we get, we're giving them a great space, so peek your head in there and check that out. All right, if you have your Bible, we're going to be over in 1 Samuel 17. This is not the first time in 20 years of doing ministry with Reverend L, where he has given a word, and it's been my message, so we'll keep it brief. And uh, you said giant killers, and here I'm talking about David and Goliath, so there's that. And uh, that's how you know that we, what you're getting ready to speak about is what, where God has you. We've been in a series called Oldies But Goodies. I hope that you have found this series to be... Uh, revelatory in that the Old Testament is still relevant today. There's principles and concepts and things that happen in the Old Testament that are relevant to the things that we go through today. And we can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater and, and be New Testament Christians. We want to have, we want, I'm thankful for the new covenant. I'm thankful for the sacrifice that Jesus made at, uh, at the cross. But the Old Testament is an arrow that points toward Christ and his coming. And we don't have that new covenant without the things that happen in the Old Testament. And so that's what we've been talking about. And again, just that, that understanding that that basic Bible knowledge, it's not in the next generation that's coming up. And we want to be a church that makes sure that there are foundations of faith that are laid, uh, not just downstairs, but even up here. And so we're going to talk about one of the most famous, probably one of the most famous Old Testament Bible stories of all time. And it is the story of David and Goliath. And I want to, I want to take it from a little bit of a different perspective. I, I want to talk to you of, of, about something that I even shared with our youth ministry about seven months ago about how Goliath actually defeated the ranks of Israel. Now he didn't defeat David, but he defeated the ranks of Israel for a long time. And I'm going to talk about the methodology of how the enemy he works oftentimes, and we're going to look at 1 Samuel 17 to do that. Uh, in, in, in this story, an entire army is, I, there's no better word for this, but an entire army is punked by one guy. Um, if you read the story of David and Goliath, the, the, the Philistines didn't have to fight. They didn't have to send out all of their soldiers. They sent out one guy, and for, 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 for an entire army, this one guy was able to frighten and, 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 and cause fear to grip an entire nation's army. What we're talking about, we're talking about the army of Israel, the army of of God's chosen people, one person had the ability to, to trash talk his way uh, into, their, into their psyche and, and really control and manipulate them. And so I want to read to you some of this story out of 1 Samuel 17. We're going to start uh, today in, in, I believe it's in verse 17, and it says this, now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and they assembled at Soko in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephes Damim between Soko and Ezekiel. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley in between them. So you kind of get the picture there. They're on two, two hillsides. There's a valley in between them. That's probably the spot where the war would happen if there was to be war. 
a champion named Goliath who was from Gath. Remember, we talked about Obed-Edom from Gath last week. The champion named Goliath who was from Gath came out of the Philistine camp, and his height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back, and his spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and his iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him, and this is how he came out every single day. Goliath stood. He just stood there, and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? This is verse 8. Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul, the king, and all. Everybody say all. The king and everybody were dismayed and terrified. Everybody. The Bible, I don't think the Bible meant his words. I don't, think, I don't think words are there by accident. The head of the country and everybody who was trained, everybody who was equipped, everybody who was there in armor, everybody who had fought other battles, everybody who had seen the hand of God move in multiple different ways at multiple different times, everybody, were, were, they were terrified and they were dismayed just simply by the words of this giant. Now, I don't know how many of you are accountants in here and numbers are your thing, but when you talk about six cubits in a span and all these shekels and sizes and all those things, those don't translate into modern English. So just to understand, I, I know that you probably know these stats about Goliath, but Goliath was about nine feet, nine inches tall. He was almost 10 feet tall. So that is, that is by all definitions, that's a giant. I mean, when we see somebody that's six, six, you know, I, that, 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 that's a big fella. I remember we had a, we had a brother that used to go uh, uh, to, to Fusion Lexington named Mike and Mike was Mike Mike would have to duck his head to walk through doorways. And I thought, I've never seen anybody bigger than that. He would have been about three feet taller than the tallest guy that I've ever seen in person who had to duck his head to go through a doorway. Nine feet, nine inches. His armor, his armor weighed 125 pounds. Like, like Corbin, stand up. I know that's a little bit embarrassing. Corbin's probably more than 100. He was wearing a Corbin around, you know, just... Just like that, and you can say, you, I'm sorry, I don't mean to embarrass you, but that's what you get on the front row. Uh, he was wearing, he was wearing a, a person around in his armor, and the, Bible's, the Bible makes clear the head of his spear weighed 35 pounds. Do you understand? I believe a shot put in high school is like eight or nine pounds. And I think a shot put for a collegiate athlete and then an Olympic athlete, I think those are like 12 or 16 pounds. That's a shot put. He had a, he had a, a, a double the size spear on the head of his javelin that he was able to throw with pinpoint accuracy. And he was able to not just lob it through the air, but cause it to, to, to fly. So I understand just from the optics of this guy, just from the optics, I could, I could see how how people might get caught up in in, in, in looking at somebody and saying, you know what, that, that's a menacing, that's an intimidating figure. But this wasn't one person against one giant. This was an entire army. You would have thought somebody in the back would have said, you know what, you take out his kneecaps, I'm going to go high, and, and, and you go low, I'll go high. And listen, it might take four or five of us to get him, but we're going to get him. No, they all stood there and they quaked in fear, not just because of his size. The Bible doesn't even say his size was a part of what caused them to fear they were dismayed and terrified simply by his words his words can you imagine an entire army afraid just because somebody knows how to trash talk to 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 defy God, to, to be able to say, you know what, You're, you, you don't have a champion that's qualified to step out with me. You don't have somebody that deserves to be on the same battlefield as me. And listen, if you win, we'll fall down and we'll just serve you. But if we win, you're going to serve us. One person was able to cause the entire ranks of Israel 
to quake in their fear. Now we look at this story and we have the, we have the, the lens of the here and now. We know how the story ends. This isn't one where we got to go into the ending. By, by, by the way, if you don't know the ending, the good guys win. David goes out and he slays him with just a sling and a stone. And, and David does his own little fair share of Jesus, you know, God, God-based trash talk here in just a minute. But the reality is, is the entire ranks of Israel were defeated by words. Now, when you put that into modern context, I have to ask, have you ever faced an obstacle, faced an enemy, faced a situation at work, faced a situation in your home where just what was being said was enough to cause you to shrink back? I believe that's where the relevance of this story is at, is we have not traveled that far in that words still have the ability to cause us to shrink back. We still cower in fear when somebody says something that we don't like. Listen, there are times where I have to ask the question, does the size and the words and the reputation of your enemy cause a fear that causes you to forget the size and the words and the reputation of your Redeemer? Do you understand? We have a Redeemer who has some size to him. The, the heavens are his throne and the earth is his footstool. Goliath would be squashed like a gnat underneath the heel of the Lord. We have a God who is so big that he is able to, to with, the, with the breath of his nostrils, he's able to, to, to just blow and things exist. I, I've shared this, I, I've stood at the rim of the Grand Canyon and I just think in the, in the majesty of God that God can form the Grand Canyon just by dragging his fingers through the dirt. He's that big. And here this enemy stands at nine feet, nine inches, big to us, but little to him. But there are times where the size and the words and the reputation of our enemy causes us to fear and forget the size and the words and the reputation of our God. There are times we need to remember not just who he is, but who we are because we're his. Who we are because we're his. What we have because we're in him. What we have because he's in us and he is alive in us. And the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is alive and well on the inside of every single person who calls upon the name of Jesus. There are times where we look at our obstacles and where we look at our enemies and we look at our foes and, and there are times where I, I hear believers talk like everybody else. You know what? It's just negativity and downtroddenness all the time and, and nothing ever gets better and nothing's, nothing ever breaks my way and nothing ever goes my way. You've already been beaten up before a single shot was ever fired. For 40 days... 40 days this Philistine comes out and he tra talks trash. For 40 days, an entire army is incapacitated because Goliath is beating him with words. With words. I wonder how long some of us have wrestled with words that your enemy has spoken over us. Some of us in here are still not defeating the words that an enemy that's already passed away spoke over our life. Some of us are stuck at 12 and 13 and what happened to us when we were 12 and 13 and 14 years old. The person that spoke those words is long gone, but their words remain and they echo in our ears as though they're still alive today. And then we'll sing songs about victory and overcoming and defeating things. And the reality is, is the words are still ringing and echoing in our ears as though they were spoken today. Listen, I'm not, I'm not a pastor that gets into self-help. I'm not a pastor that gets into living your best life and, and, and you leaving with a message that's more akin to a TED talk. But I would be remiss in saying that your self-talk in the reverberation of words that were spoken a generation ago, those are oftentimes the things that beat us faster than anything else that happens in our life. It is why salvation in the armor of God is the helmet. Because God does not want words to continue to incapacitate you and cause you to not live out your salvation. He wants your, he wants your, your mind protected from the enemy and the arrows that come from the enemy into your mind, through your ears, down into your heart. Listen, the enemy knows if he can't defeat you, he'll just discourage you. And if you live discouraged, 
you will never see the destiny that God has for you. You will never go as far and as fast as you could go if you live discouraged and defeated all the time. Listen, words are the most powerful weapon on earth. They really are. God made it so. They're, they're, they're powerful in, in, in a negative manner, but they're powerful in a positive manner as well. Words, words, words are what you, you make them. If, if you think about how God created the heavens and the earth, and you think, about, you think about the Genesis account, the Bible says that he spoke in everything except for us. Everything except for us was spoken into existence. It tells us the power of our words. If you think about the book of Revelation, when Jesus comes back as the rider on the white horse, the Bible says that a sword comes from his mouth with which to judge the nations. And literally, literally, he speaks and things come to an end when he speaks. And here's the thing that's wonderful about God. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of Almighty God. Well, I'm made in the image of God, but you know, God's the one with the powerful words. No, he tells you, even you, the power of life and death is in the tongue. God's trying to get a message across to us that our words are, are shaping and molding and growing. And listen, listen, it's why James tells us that a whole ship can be steered with a small rudder. And the tongue is an unruly evil of restless poison set inside our members. With it, we bless God, and with it, we curse men, it says in the book of James. And the Bible makes very, very clear that you are made to be like God. You want to see a kid grow up to be nothing? You want to see a kid grow up to never hit his potential or her potential? You want to see a kid that, 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 that has all the promise in the world and the prowess in the world and never goes on to do anything? Get around to mom and dad and see what they're saying to their kid. Or about their kid. It's one of the things that I've seen as a dad. And, and, and my, kids, my kids sometimes don't like coming to this church because I talk about them. But I, you know, I'm paying for you so I get to talk about <laughs> Both of my girls are that way. I, 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 can, I can look at my daughter, my oldest, not so much my youngest. My, she's more steely. But I've never seen a broken look in my oldest face more than if I said, I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed. And I, I don't throw that around. I, I, don't throw, I don't throw that around often. And my, my youngest is definitely a words kid. She, 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 needs, she needs a dad that says, you know what, you're doing a good job. You know what, you're, you're, you're beautiful. L listen, I try to tell them, I want to tell them certain sort of things so they don't have to find it in nobody else. I want them to know what they're looking for because they've had it all along. Yes. I want them to see me treat their mother with dignity and respect and, and show them with my words and with my act. That doesn't mean I don't argue with my wife, but I want them to see me apologize. I want them to see me have, have, have humility. I'm not always perfect, but I want them to know this is what it looks like. This is, this is what relationship looks like. I want them to understand words are, are powerful when, they, when they're mothers and, and, and when they marry somebody and there's fathers in the situation. I want them to understand you are molding and shaping by what you are saying all the time. And you can create victory in the life of your children or you can create a sense of defeat that goes on with them for decades long after you're gone simply by the words that spill out of your mouth. That's why the New Testament talks about us being judged for every word, every idle word that falls from our mouth. God literally keeps track of your speech some of us have been through college and you have to write a thousand word essay. God's kept track of every, you, you, you know how you are when you're writing that thousand word essay. You got the word count, you know, like the, 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 and, and, it, it, it all counts. God counts all those idle words. He's got word count on you and he knows if they're idle and if they're worthless and they're useless. He knows if they were put out there to cause intimidation or fear. He knows if they were put out there with malice and envy and greed. He knows the tenor and the tone and the attitude of the words that come out of your mouth. The Bible even says that there was a time where Jesus was around the Pharisees and he perceived their thoughts. 
God wants us to be careful with our words, but with those same words, we have the ability to mold and shape and to build up and to lift up and to encourage and to equip and, and to build into our children and our families and our coworkers, the people around us. We have the ability to, to build good things. Goliath was able to literally defeat an army for 40 days just because he caused fear. You know, one of the... One of the Greek translations for devil comes from the Greek word diabolos. And there's, there's, different, there's different meanings to that compound word, that dia and, and, and bolos. But one of the, one of the Greek definitions of, of, of that compound word, dia, means to penetrate. And, 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 and balo means to throw like a ball or a rock. Literally, that picture of the enemy is one who defeats the hardened facade by just repeatedly throwing and striking in the same spot over and over and over. And I can't think of anything being repetitious and in our ear and in our spirit more than words striking at that same spot. You're never going to amount to anything. You're never going to be anything more than what your mom or your dad told you, you're never, you're never going to overcome that addiction. You're never over, going to overcome that fear. If anybody were to find out who you really are over and over and over, he just hits. He hits, he hits, he hits, he hits. And this is exactly how Goliath is used by the enemy against the army of Israel. But a shepherd boy comes along who's too young and too naive and too inexperienced to be defeated by something as simplistic as, as words. He's too full of God. He's too full of, he's too full of courage. He's, he's too full of belief. And some of you might say too full of belief. Listen, listen, he's got so much belief, he ain't got no space for unbelief. He's too full of belief. And God has already, earlier in the story, used him to defeat things that might not have been Goliath, but they were Goliath-like. If you read the story of David, what he's done already with that little sling and with that little stone, it preps him to come up. Now, 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 now David doesn't belong here yet because in this part of the story, the Bible says that David is just carrying supplies back and forth to his brothers who are of age to fight. At some point in the story, it says that David is just carrying some cheese. You know, sometimes God will find the most unlikely soldier just carrying a wheel of cheese. Some of you are like, I knew that pizza was a God thing. I knew it. I knew it was. Don't tell me it's not of the Lord. It's of the Lord. He's, he's carrying supplies back and forth to the line. And, and he's ruddy. I don't even know what that means. I just don't feel like I'd want to be called ruddy. He's ruddy in his youth. You know, The Bible says he's, he's kind of handsome, but he's a boy. He's just a boy. And he's got a, I mean, come on, a slingshot? This isn't what you think of like the old... This is one you get a good sized stone in and, and, and you're winding up. It's one, it's one of these deals. And the Bible makes very clear that David knew that Goliath would fall that day. You know the story. He tells, he tells David some things. David says some things back. As, as David walks up to the line carrying his supplies, it says he was talking with the army, probably his brothers and, the, and Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, steps out from his line, shouts his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. And the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. Hey, listen, if you've got to defeat your enemies, all you get is a tax break. It's worth it. It's right there. It's right in the text. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now you might think David is, David is speaking about Goliath, but he's also saying something that reminds them, hey, you're the armies of the living God. Why are you letting him defy you? 
It's a reminder. Remember who you are. Remember where you've already come from. Man, sometimes past victories get forgotten by present problems. I can't. It's not on my text. (laughs) David had fresh years. He had fresh faith. And the reward outweighed the risk. And sometimes, man, listen, sometimes an old problem needs new ears to hear it. It needs new eyes to see it. It needs fresh faith to come up on it. If you're battling something you can't get over, listen, sometimes you need to throw that context and that content in front of a new person. If the old crowd isn't helping you get through an old thing, sometimes you might need to take the old thing in front of a new crowd. As a follower of Jesus, we have to believe that with Christ in our corner, the odds are in our favor. Victory is at hand. Destiny is within reach. And you might just have a big trash-talking obstacle in the way. And sometimes you just got to take out the trash. Sometimes you just got to get it out of the way. You hang out with the same people that say you can't, and I guarantee you won't. Some of us surround ourselves with people that call them realists. They call themselves realists. And you drop your dreams in front of realists. Well, have you thought about all the things that could go wrong? Have you thought about all the expenses? Have you thought about all the pitfalls? Have you thought about all of the problems that you may encounter and the bible says that we're not supposed to cast our pearls before swine sometimes you got to pick out the pigs Amen. verse 41 meanwhile the philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to david he looked david over and saw that he was little more than a boy glowing with health and handsome and he despised him and he said to david am i a dog that you come at me with sticks And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. For the first time in verse 45, Goliath gets a rebuttal. Think about that. When was the last time you rebutted your enemy? Some of you sit and let people spew venom all day long. Listen, God hasn't called. Come on, men, be men. God hasn't called us to sit back and swallow garbage all the day with, all the time without saying something back. Sometimes you got to clap back. And this is the first time in 40 days that anybody has dared say anything to Goliath. And it's coming out of a 17-year-old boy. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and the javelin, but I come against you, look at it, in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. Not the army of Israel. He said, you're going to fall to me, Jack. And I'm going to strike you down. I'm going to cut off your head. It just got dark. David didn't say, I'm going to take you out. You're going to be in prison. You're going to, you're going to do some time. He said, man, I'm going, to, I'm going to slay you, and I'm going to cut your head off. Amen. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine armies. Now he's talking trash to the whole army. Not just you, because once you go down, the big timber has fallen. We're coming and cutting the rest of the trees down. The carcasses of the Philistines' army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world, the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Listen, sometimes we need to step up and represent God and say, you know what? The whole world's going to know there's a God in my life. The whole world's going to know there's a God at Fusion. The whole world's going to know there's a God in Richland County. The whole world's going to know because I'm not going to shrink back, I'm not going to shut up, and I'm not going to step down. The whole world's going to know. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spirit that the Lord saves us. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him. I love this part. We so often overlook this. The nine foot nine lumbering lumberjacks lumbering toward little David. And the Bible says very quickly, the whole army has shrank back. The whole army has been terrified. The whole army has been dismayed. They've stepped back every time Goliath has talked. When Goliath starts to move forward toward David, what's David do? David doesn't turn around and run. He starts running toward Goliath. This is the first time Goliath's probably ever seen this in his life. Somebody is running at me. 
He's running at me. David runs quickly toward the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it and he struck the Philistine on the forehead. It doesn't just say he got struck and got a lump. The Bible says the stone sank into his forehead. It moved at the velocity of a bullet. It went through a skull and into his dome. He hit that big old melon with that little stone, that big old grape. He hit it right dead in the center and it sunk through the skull. Now I have to believe, I have to believe that little ruddy arm. I don't know how fast he was able to get that stone moving, but I have to believe the Holy Spirit put a little bit of velocity behind that rock. Because if he was nine foot nine and he was wearing 125 pounds of armor, how in the world is his skull not thick? Some of you men got thick. Come on, we got thick heads. You know his is extra thick. Extra thick. That stone, boom, goes into his forehead. It sinks. And he falls face down. I, I almost feel like it's got a tree noise to it. Cracking and splitting as it falls to the ground. The Bible says David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and without a sword in his hand, and he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Now, David had to be true to his word. He said, I'm going to cut off your head. David only had a sling and a stone. So David goes over and he gets the Philistine's sword. Now, if his, if his javelin had a spearhead that was 125 pounds, I don't even know what that sword weighed. David probably drew it out of his scabbard and did one of these deals. <laughs> Raises it over his head. He's like, I got to hit him, sure, because if I miss, I'm just going to, it's going to be ugly. And the Bible says, boom. The head comes off, David. <laughs> Some of y'all don't read the Bible. That's in there. I didn't add this. You want to read a fun book? Read the book of Judges. You'll see some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> like, man, can I, I, feel, I feel guilty for reading it. That's the Bible. It's in there. He cuts his head off. But listen, David was too young. He was too inexperienced. He, he wasn't even first among his brothers. He had everything stacked against him. I mean, he came at him with a rock. Didn't have the right weapons, didn't have the respect of the enemy, didn't have the respect of his compatriots. For every thing stacked against him, the one thing that mattered was that he moved. He moved in belief of his God. He knew the size, he knew the reputation, and he knew the words of the Father. And rather than being fearful of the size and the words and the reputation of the enemy, he was encouraged by the size and the words and the reputation of his Redeemer. Listen, how do you get rid of discouragement and defeat? You fill yourself to overflowing with encouragement and victory. Well, how do I, how do, I do that, Pastor? I'm going to have you come, Pastor. Looking so nice today in your tie, in your new shoes. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Listen, that list of, of why nots of David, that might be your list. Some of you are called to ministry and you're stuck in mediocrity. Because of words, self-talk, generations of listening to the wrong people. There's not a lack of pulpits in our country. There's not a lack of church buildings in our country. There's a lack of people who step out in courage and say yes. That's the problem with the church. We're a collective of called people. Who refused to stand? I know all that goes along with that. You're not going to be able to, 
You're not going to be able to make a living. You're not going to be able to feed your family. You're going to have to do something else. It's going to be years and years of toil and labor. And there's other things that you can do that you can make an impact where you're at and you can, you, you, you know, you can reach those people and, 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 and you are literally talking yourself out of the call of God. You're talking yourself out of the adventure, out of the journey. You're talking yourself out of seeing the, the mighty hand of God provide in ways that you can't imagine. You're talking yourself out of, of a calling and talking yourself into a career. Careers are fine. Some of you are called. Well, pastor, I'm not called to be behind the pulpit. Listen, I, you are called to be active in the body. If you're not the general of the army, you're at least a soldier. You understand? Somebody else will do it. Yes, somebody else probably will because God's work will get done. If he can't move through you, he'll move past you. Could you imagine what would happen to a community if a whole church, one whole church, just one whole church, everybody in the church said, I'm doing something. I'm going to do my part. That would not change the church. That would change the community. Well, I don't know, pastor. You know, we're just a few hundred people. Twelve men. Let me revise that. Eleven men. Because Judas didn't make the final cut. Eleven men changed the world. For millennia. For millennia. Because they were willing to not allow the voice of the enemy to cause them to sit idly by. While the enemy had his way. I don't want to create a sermon text where I've pointed out the problem, but I leave you without the solution. The solution is really actual, sim actually simple to this. I believe that we can only fit so many voices into our life. And I believe that to get the bad ones out, you have to push them out with new voices. To get the old words out, you have to put new words in to push the, the bad out. It's kind of like I tell people I've been in ministry for 23 years and my, my Rolodex, some of you don't even know what a Rolodex is. My cloud that's in my head only, only has so much storage space. Now I put a name in and one falls out the other side. It's just like that name came in, that one went out, you know. You have to push out the old with the new. You have to push out lies with the truth. Yes. Well, pastor, I don't know. I don't know how to, to read the word. I don't know how to, to study scripture. Let me just, let me just, let me just tell you. I Googled. Don't tell me you can't Google. Everybody in here can Google. I Googled what and who does the Bible say I am in Christ? And lists of scripture came up. Like 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You ain't the you that you used to be. 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Scriptures like Galatians 2, 20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Scriptures like Ephesians 2, 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Listen. And if your daddy told you you were a piece of garbage, listen, you need to know you are his workmanship and God don't make junk. He don't make junk. John 1, 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You might have a different last name, but you need to understand that last name doesn't determine your destiny. It doesn't determine your future because you are the son or daughter of Jehovah. You are the son or daughter of the most high God. John 15, 15, no longer do I call you servants. I'm not just a servant of God for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend for all 
that I've heard from my Father, I've made known to you. Jesus makes known to you the thoughts and heartbeat of God. Galatians 3.26, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Colossians 3.3, 3, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You don't like your past, it's hidden with Christ in God. You don't like the garbage that you did or the addiction that you had. It's hidden with Christ in God. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. You are the body of Christ and individually members of it. You have a place. You fit in. You belong. Listen to me. Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided, we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Listen, God doesn't lift up junk. He doesn't lift up garbage. One day you're going to be called with him with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise and you're going to be glorified with him in eternity. You're going to sit there at the, 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 the marriage supper of the lamb. You're going to have a seat at the table. You might not have been invited to the party. You might not have been on the guest list when it comes to everything else. But your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. You got your name on the guest list of the best party that's ever going to be had. Jeremiah 1 and 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I set you apart. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Ephesians 4, 24. Put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. And I digress. I could go on and on and on and on and on. But listen, if you want to choose to continue to be who you were when you were 12. If you want to continue to listen to the words that were spoken to you a generation ago by a generation that has passed. That is your choice. But I choose to believe that I am who he says I am. That I can have what he says I can have. That I can go where he says I can go. That I can do what he says I can do. I want to walk that way. I want to believe that way. And I want to see what this great adventure called life can yield when I stop cowering to the enemy who is just trash talking. Who is just talking smack and talking garbage. I want to have the faith of David where I start running toward my enemies. And my enemy for the first time in their life goes, oh, wait a second. I ain't never had nobody run at me before. What if a whole church just started running at the enemy? Just started sprinting toward them. What would the enemy do, that single solitary bully on the playground, when you just start sprinting toward him? Listen, some of you need to understand. There's the exterior bullies, but some of you continue to be the internal bullies of your own life. You're taking your own lunch money. Get your mind and your heart off of repeat and replay. Quit rewinding and replaying what happened in the past. Can you do anything about something that happened yesterday? Can you? Can you do anything about something that happened last week, last month, last year, or in your last marriage? I'm just going to say this. Even in some marriages, I know that some of the men, and I don't like that, and the Lord doesn't like that, but the reality is you're dragging your last marriage into your new marriage. And the same you that broke the one in the past is getting ready to break the one in the future. It's time to start letting the past determine where you are right now. You've got to move forward. If you fall, you fall forward. If you stumble, you stumble forward. If you crawl, you crawl forward. The direction is always, say it with me, forward, 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 sprint toward your enemy. And believe in the size and the reputation and the words of your God. Stand to our feet today. Father, in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, right now we come to you with belief, with faith, with courage, Lord. We believe we are who you say we are because we believe you are who you say you are. It all hinges on that. We believe you are who you say you are. We believe you can do what you say you can do. We've seen it happen in the past. And Lord, right now, I pray that chains and shackles of words spoken a generation ago by a generation that may even be gone, that those chains would audibly fall to the floor today. That we would hear those generational curses just falling to the floor, breaking off. Lord Jesus, that 
the generations moving forward would walk in generational blessing, generational anointing, generational courage, generational faith in the name of Jesus. Father, we speak against fear in the name of Jesus. It has no place in the life of a believer. There are people in this room that are called to start a business. They've been held back by the words of the Goliaths in their life, but you have called them. There are people in this room that are called to ministry. They've been held back by the words of the Goliath in their life. Lord Jesus, break those off right now. There are people that are called to be leaders in the communities. They're called to school boards. They're called to councils. They're called to, called to township trustees. And Lord, they've been held back by the words of the Goliaths in their life. Break them off in the name of Jesus. There are people in this room that are called to serve in this house, in this church. And they have been told by their past that they can't do anything right now. Break that off in the name of Jesus. Allow us to walk in the freedom, the calling, the anointing that you say we have right now in the name of Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Before we go today, do you have faith in the Lord? Have you put your faith in the Lord? Are you walking with the Lord? You may have stumbled or you may have allowed yourself to fall out of fellowship with the Lord. And today the Lord's calling you back into fellowship with him. Or maybe for the first time ever, you've come and the Lord is speaking to your heart. and He's saying today is the day. Now is the time. Give yourself to me. Walk with me. Walk with me. Come on, this is between you and the Lord today. If you need to get right with the Lord today, nobody's looking. It's just me and you and the Lord. Put your hand up. Say, that's me, Pastor. I want to walk out of this place right with the Lord today. Amen. 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 If you'd say, you know what, I want to I, I walk with courage today. And I, that, listen, I love Jesus, but my courage has been lower than it needs to be. And there are spots where I have felt guilty because I know where the Lord wanted me to be bold and I shrank back. And you need to step out in faith and start running toward those bold moments. Put your hand up and say, I want to be bold. I want to be bold. I want to be bold. Let's pray today. Let's pray today. Father, right now we pray for boldness. The Holy Spirit, Lord, we need, we need more believers who are filled with the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost gives us courage to speak the truth. Lord, right now I just pray, Father, that you would embolden your body of believers. Now is not the time to allow the Goliaths to come out and taunt us and keep us quiet. Lord Jesus, we need to be a church that's full of people running toward the enemy and saying, not today, not today not today. Lord Jesus, we need to have the faith to move. We need to have the ability, God, to step out and believe that the Lord will deliver us from our enemy. And Lord, right now, I pray that this would be a church full of people who are filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with the, the spirit, the presence of God in their life. And Lord, when they have that, that boldness well up the, on the inside of them, I pray that they would step out in faith and speak, 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 because words are powerful. Lord Jesus, help us to be people who are pace setters in our community, in our families, with our children, Lord. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask everybody to just pray with me today. Dear Jesus, I give my whole life to you. The good, the bad, the ugly. I ask you today, Jesus, forgive me of my sins and be the Lord of my life. I give you all of me so I can have all of you. In Jesus' name. Father, be with my friends as they go. Help them to be salt and light, a city that's set upon a hill that cannot be hidden. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you guys. Have a safe Memorial Day. Enjoy your family. Eat a burger for me. God bless you.